Hey, welcome to ACF Church, and we're so glad that you're with us watching this message online. And our hope is that it would encourage you to be more like Jesus and walk closely with Him as an apprentice of Christ. And our hope is to give away all of these resources for free as much as possible. It takes a lot of time and energy and people to make that happen. And if you'd like to support the mission of God financially for ACF Church, you can go to acfak.org and you can give. I'm Allie Gardner and I'm the director at ACF Kids. And I was asked to share my testimony but I wanted to share it in a little different way. I wanted to actually talk about an experience that I had as a child, something that made me who I am today because God placed a beautiful woman in my life on my path that helped me to feel like I belonged long before I believed in Christ. I grew up in a household where my parents did not graduate from high school. My dad dropped out when he was in eighth grade and my mom was a freshman in high school. And they knew what life was like without an education. So they really pushed education for me. And my mom actually taught me to read when I was three years old. And I loved reading, I loved learning. I was so excited to go to school. I was one of those kids that would wake up before everybody else because today was a school day, not because it was Saturday. One day, I was in the first grade, and um, my class was actually uh, in music, and we were dancing to um, Skip to My Lou, My Darling. And I remember the secretary walking into the classroom, and she had this weird look on her face, and then she called me out. And as we're walking down this long hallway, I was terrified. I was uh, trying to figure out what I'd done wrong because I I'm a good kid and I shouldn't be going to the office. As we walked through those double doors, I saw my mom. My mom was sitting in a car sobbing and um, I'd never seen her like that. And I ran over to her and I asked, what's wrong? And all she could get out was, daddy has been hit by a train. I don't remember a whole lot at that point. I know we were at the hospital for eight days uh, while he was in the ICU. It was such a weird experience to walk into this room where your hero, who was so strong and gave you horsey rides, no matter how tired he was after work, um, would play ball tag in the, in the yard and sit out and watch the stars at night and make stories up. And he was a good storyteller. He used to tell me awesome bedtime stories with these goofy voices every night. And then he'd give me butterfly kisses before we'd go to sleep. So it was really hard seeing him there like that. I remember the look on some adult faces that came in to talk to us the last day. They knew what was coming and they gave us time to say goodbye. And I will tell you that that moment with my dad is precious and it's hard to put into words what it felt like to say goodbye, but I'm grateful for it. And I hugged him and I told him I loved him and gave him one last butterfly kiss. And then life was kind of a blur after that for a while. It was decided that we needed to normalize a little bit and that meant going back to school and it'd been a while since we'd been and I had this irrational fear um, that when that door opened every time to the classroom that somebody else was going to be gone. And so school had lost that enchantment, that excitement that I'd had. Um, and one day I was sitting in my little group and the kids started talking about their dads. And my heart broke and I started crying and I was embarrassed so I crawled underneath the table. And I cried and, and the next thing I know, 
My teacher, Mrs. Fred, had pulled me out onto her lap, and the whole class was gone. She'd sent them all out. And she sat and she just held me, and she let me sob. And I'm talking ugly girl sobbing. Like, ugly, crying, just terrible, right? And she just held me, and she let me cry, and she rocked me back and forth, and she rubbed my back, and just let me cry. And then I sat there, and she pulled back and looked me straight in the eye, and she said, I love you. And in that moment, I had two thoughts. The first one was, that's weird. My teacher just said she loves me. The very next thought was, I'm going to be a teacher someday. Because in that moment, I recognized a feeling, a warmth that was spreading through me of something I'd forgotten, a passion, a love. And I recognized that I wanted to do that for another child someday. So I've been an educator and I've been able to love and serve kids all over the world. I have been blessed to serve kids that, the ones that everybody says they don't want, because I was one of them. So I know where they're coming from. And I'll tell you that a lot of people question why I want to serve at ACF Kids. And I'll tell you it's because of Mrs. Fred. I felt this call, a purpose in my life when I was really young. I was only seven when I knew what I wanted to do. And it was not something that I had thought out, it was something I felt. And it was because of somebody in my path, in my story, that loved me enough to show me that I could continue living even when times were tough. And I would venture to say that if you are struggling to find that purpose, if you are struggling to figure out what it is that you're being called to do, go out and serve. I'd love for you to come join our Empowered team. We encourage families and children right where they are, and we engage the whole child of God. That means mind, body, and spirit, because we down there are loving these kids so that we can equip them to go and amplify the grace of Jesus to the church, the unchurched, and the dechurched. We'd love to have you come down and learn what love is really about. I'm, I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> hey guys, happy 4th of July. My name is Josh, I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm so glad that you're with us today. If you're watching online, thank you for tuning in and just being a part of our community for a few moments this morning. And Allie shared her story, and it's right in line with what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're in a series called Masterclass, and we are walking through the book of James this summer. I want to encourage you uh, to be reading along with us. We actually have this amazing reading plan that we have put together, and there's even kind of different levels of following along with us. And so they have those right outside the doors as you leave this morning. If you didn't pick one of those up, and trust me, we're in James chapter 2 today, starting chapter 2. So if you've been behind, you can catch up really quick and really easy. We are taking our time as we are reading through the book of James. And I love the book of James because it's so straightforward. And most people, if most Christians, most churchgoers, if you ask, hey, what's your favorite book in the, in the New Testament? So many are going to say the book of James because it's just black and white. It's just plain and easy to understand and follow. There's not a crazy hidden message, no parables or stuff like that you've got to figure out. It's just really straightforward. And if you don't know about the book of James, it, it was written by the half-brother of Jesus, and now the half-brother of Jesus didn't become a Jesus follower until after Jesus had died and rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven. And after that, James was, was not a believer in Jesus. He didn't believe that his older brother was the Son of God until he saw him raised from the dead. And the book of James also, it's, it's the first book written in the New Testament. So when you, you read through the New Testament, they're all letters written um, or, or kind of um, or the, you have the Gospels as well, but they're, they're all written, and they're all written at different times, and James is actually the first one written, and it's written to a very young, young church in its infant stage, 
And you can kind of read through James and you also read through the book of Acts to see what's going on early on in, in, the, in the birth of the church. And, and James is writing and he, he's starting to see some stuff pop up. He's starting to see things in the church that need to be addressed The way these new Jesus followers were treating each other, the way that they were acting, the way that they were um, engaging in society. James is like, hey, there's some stuff that we need to talk about, you know, church, early young church, um, that we got to address now before it, it gets too bad. And so last week... Pastor Brian did an amazing job talking about the end of chapter one. And the end of chapter one is a pretty famous verse in the Bible where James says, this is what true religion is. This is what true religion is, that you would serve the orphans and the widows. And then he goes on right after that and says, now don't be stained by the world. Don't be stained by the world. If you didn't get a chance to watch last week's message, you weren't here, you weren't watching online, I want to encourage you, go and watch that message. You can download our ACF Church app and watch it. It's a really important message for us today. And James writes this, this is what true religion is. You would serve the orphans and widows and don't be stained by the world. Now, the Bible as we have it, when you open it up, it's got chapters and verses in it. It's really nice and helpful to read and to study. But what we need to understand and realize is that if you, you, maybe this has never dawned on you before, but when these letters were written, they weren't written with chapters and verses. We added those thousands of years later to help us study, and I'm grateful for them. But sometimes there, there's a break, maybe there's a chapter two comes in, and it can make us think that there's now a mind shift in James. Now he's going to go talk about something else. But I believe he's really not doing that here. He says, hey, this is what true religion is, to love the orphans and widows, don't be stained by the world, and boom, he rolls into what we call chapter two now. But I believe that this is a continuing thought where he gets real practical with what this actually looks like. So we're going to jump in this morning. I'm going to read James 2, starting in verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 13. So there's a little bit of a chunk here. If you have your Bibles, open those up to James chapter 2, verses 1, and we're going to go through 13. If you don't have a Bible, you can download our ACF Church app. There's a Bible on that. And also, it will be behind me on the screen. But let's go ahead and read James chapter 2. My brothers, Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my feet, uh, have you not made distinctions among yourselves? And become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has God not chosen the poor, uh, those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which, uh, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones the ones who oppress you, the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the, uh, convicted by the law of transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has been guilty of it all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are being judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the, to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay, so there's this pretty big chunk we're going to dive into this this morning. But what James is doing is he sees this issue in this very young church in its infant stage. And he says, hey, we need to address this right now. We got to tackle an issue that I'm seeing right now. And we see it in James chapter when he starts out right away. And he says, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. I love the New Living Translation version of this. It actually says, my brothers, how can you say you have faith and show partiality? So what we're going to talk about today is this word partiality. 
Partiality. This is what we're going to talk about today. This is this thing that James tackles in, 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 in his letter, chapter 2. But really, I believe it's connected completely to the, the final thoughts of chapter 1. So what does partiality mean? Uh, in the Greek, which, which James is, spoke in the letter that was written, this word partiality, it actually means to receive the face. It's kind of weird, okay? To receive the face, like, hey, I'm going to receive your face today. See, what this word partiality means, it it means that that I'm going to make a judgment or or, or a distinction about you by what I see on the outside. I'm going to judge you by what I see on the outside. Oh, I like your face. I'm going to treat you a certain way. You have a nice face. Ooh, you don't have a nice face. I'm going to treat you a different way, right? Like, the face is is the first thing we see when we see people. And we make judgments and we make distinctions about people by what their face looks like. That's, that's what this idea of partiality means. That I'm going to make a judgment according to your face. I'm going to receive the face. And, and James goes into some, this really specific detail of what this looks like in the church, probably what was actually happening in certain situations. But we, what we need to understand is to receive the face, does it, it's not just about like what you physically look like. To receive the face can, can look like a lot of different things. It can have to do with your physical appearance. It can have to do with your social status. It could have to do with like what political party you're lining up with. It could have to do with your race. It can have to do with you know, uh, how much money you have. Like All these different things kind of fall under this idea of receiving the face. Like, I'm going to treat you a certain way because of what I see about you with like politics or race or money or whatever it is. That, that's going to decide and be the determining factor to how I treat you. You see, in James chapter 1, again, I start out by saying he talks about this is what true religion is, that you, that you would take care of the orphans and widows and don't, don't be stained by the world. And, and then he goes right into this little section that we just read. Now, sometimes Christians have read this idea of don't be stained by the world as to mean I can't be in the world. Like our job as Christians is to, to pull everything back to huddle up in church or to huddle up with just a few families and to cut off anything of the world and and not be part of this world and and to get out of the world. Like, we can't be stained by the world, and so we can't be involved in it in any way, shape, or form. There's a lot of people that have connected those dots and gone down that camp, but that's not what James is talking about at all. In fact, the last words of Jesus to us were, go into the world. Right? Go into the world. Don't run away from the world. Don't run out. Don't, don't hit the eject button. Don't create a little safe bubble that you live in and, and avoid everything of the world. No, Jesus tells us to go into the world and be creating disciples as you go into the world. So when James says don't be stained by the world, he's not talking about interacting with people in the world. See, what he's talking about is something entirely different. He's talking about the way we think. You see, Jesus shows up, and Jesus came to establish his kingdom here on earth, right? That's when he teaches us to pray, like, your kingdom be on earth as it is in heaven. That's why we have our shirts say, in Alaska as in heaven, because that's our part of the world that we get to live in. Jesus had this kingdom mindset, and it was this, like, upside-down kingdom, right? Everything was opposite. Jesus says, all the poor, they're the ones who are rich, like, you're blessed when you're mourning. Like, he, he has this crazy upside-down kingdom, and it's a way that we think. And so when James says, don't be stained by the world, what he's saying is, don't let the thinking, the way the world thinks, don't let that affect you. Don't think the way the world thinks. Think the way Jesus thinks. Think in a, ke- uh, in a, in a kingdom mindset. Think in a heavenly mindset, not a worldly mindset. And that's what James is talking about. He says, don't be stained by the world. Think like the kingdom of God, not like the world. Because the world does this, right? Doesn't the world, we treat each other with partiality. It's all about how we treat people. Like, oh, how you look, the way you think, the, 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 the political party you're a part of, or your race, or your gender, whatever it is, whatever I see about you, that's going to determine the way I treat you. That is how the world acts. And to be honest, that's how we all act at times. And so James is saying, no, we got to act and think differently. We can't live with partiality. In our lives. And then he goes on to this example. He says, Suppose a rich man comes into your gathering. Suppose a rich man, and he, he kind of says he's got a gold ring and fine clothes. For them in their culture, a gold ring meant something, it was a status symbol. 
Remember, there's no middle class for them. It was rich and poor. And so the rich, yeah, they would dress in fine clothes, but if you wore a gold ring, it meant that you had power. It meant that you were influential. Uh, You were probably a political leader if you wore a gold ring, right? Basically, wearing a gold ring meant that, like, you were a celebrity, right? And so he's like, say a celebrity walks into your gathering. Would you treat him differently? You know, can you imagine if you're like, church is getting ready to start, it's a few minutes before, and you're hanging out, and you're in the aisle here, you're up in the lobby area, and all of a sudden, like, Michael Jordan comes walking up the stairs? Like, I think you might freak out, right? Like, I would. Okay, I'll be honest. I would freak out. When Michael Jordan comes walking upstairs, you might treat him a little differently than you're treating everybody else, right? Like, say you're in a conversation, and your friend's talking to you, and like, Michael Jordan walks up, and you're just like, shut, 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 shut. Go away, go away, go away. Like, oh my goodness, his airness has entered the building, right? And maybe it's not Michael Jordan for you. Maybe it's, it's someone else. It's, it's, I have no idea. You know, Tom Hanks, it's your favorite singer. It's, it's whoever. It could be your favorite pastor. Like, I have no idea. But that person that you kind of put up on a pedestal, like, you might treat them a little bit differently, right? You might treat them just a little bit better than you were treating everybody else around. Hey, I got a seat right here. You want to come sit next to me, MJ? I got a nice seat right here. Come sit next to me. Right? Like we would, we would treat those people that we esteem, that we kind of put up on a pedestal, that we think are kind of better than the other people around, and we treat them a little differently. And I was thinking about that as I was kind of preparing for this. I was like, why do we do that? Why do we treat people differently? Why do I treat, if I think someone is just awesome, like, like a celebrity status person, like why do I treat them, why would I treat them better than I would treat somebody else? And I think the reason is, is because the way we view relationships, so often we view our relationships mostly as transactions, right? Like, what can I get out of this relationship? What can you do for me? Can you do something for me? Well, then I'm just probably going to treat you a little bit better, right? Like, if, if, if it was Michael Jordan came in here, it's like, oh, maybe I can get an autograph from him. And then I can have that and sell it on eBay for a lot of money, right? Like maybe I, can get a, maybe I can get a picture. It's like, hey, I'm just reading my Bible app right now, not taking pictures, not weird, nope. And, and I want to get a picture with MJ because then I can throw it up on social media and be awesome for like seven whole minutes on social media. <laughs> right? Like, oh, oh my God, my friends will freak out when they see me and MJ at church together. Like, because we, we treat people better, but I think so often because it's like, what can I get out of this relationship? I don't know if you listen to Jay-Z or not, but he actually talks about this in a song. He has a lyric that says, next time I'm in church, please no photos. It's like, uh, apparently Jay-Z goes to church at least occasionally, um, which I did not know, and people are taking his pictures. Like, it's literally, it's a thing, like, he had to write about it in a song. And, and, and because we do this, we treat people that we see as celebrities, just better than you know, it doesn't even have to be celebrity, right? It's just better than status. Like, maybe it's your boss's boss comes walking in, and you're like, oh, some FaceTime with the big man. Like, okay, hey, how are you doing? And, and we just, we treat them better. And it doesn't mean we don't engage people. It doesn't mean we won't have conversation. It's, it's this idea that I would treat somebody better than I would treat somebody else. And I think we do that. It's because we have this what can I get from you mentality, and if you really break it down to something simple, maybe something we've all dealt with in our lives, it's, let's say, the, the, the house next door sells, right? And, you're, and, you're, and you have your house, and you're like, all right, who are the new neighbors? What's going to happen? Who, who do we got moving in? And the moving van starts showing up, and you're like, okay, we've got some moving vans coming in. All of a sudden, like, the 15-passenger van rolls up in the driveway, and you're like, uh-oh. And 17 kids roll out of a 15-passenger van, and you're like, oh, no. Oh, no. And then, like, seven dogs come out after those 17 kids. Like, why, God? Okay, so we are getting the house. They're probably going to ask us to unpack. They're probably going to ask us to babysit. Like, oh, let's get out of here. Don't want to meet the new neighbors quite yet. But then all of a sudden, like, the brand new Kingfisher boat comes rolling into their driveway. And you're like, honey, we're having the neighbors over for dinner. Hey, glad to meet you. Do you need a babysitter ever? We love kids. I'd love to have you and your whole family over. Of course. Bring the dogs. Just invite me on your boat. Right? Like we, we live in this society where and it's all of us. We live in this transaction society with our relationships. What can you do for me? And if you can do something for me, well, then I'll treat you better than I'll treat other people. 
And James continues this example and he says, suppose a poor man comes in in shabby clothes and you tell him, hey, you sit in the back, you sit at my feet. See, inviting them to sit at their feet was actually a quite an insulting thing to do. He says, a poor person comes in with shabby clothes and you tell them, you insult them by offering them to sit on the floor. But you don't make room for them. You don't make a space for them. And we do this again. It's, it's receive the face. It's partiality. Well, I'll, I'll treat you better because I think you can do something for me. I'm actually going to treat you worse because there's nothing you can do for me. In fact, you probably just want to take from me instead. And I'm going to treat you worse because of that, this, this partiality. And, and yeah, maybe we don't do that at church so much. We've got really good at like pretending we like people. right? But when we're not at church, don't we do this often? Like, have you ever been to Fred Myers here in Eagle River? They've got like two entrances. They're like a mile apart from each other, right? And I hate it when I park in the one. I'm like, oh, I, got, I came here for food, and I got to walk the mile long down to the other side of the store. But have you ever come walking in, and you see someone standing by the door? Like, imagine you're walking in, and, and there's like a homeless person by the door, and, and th- you can tell they're kind of asking people for food. They're asking for help, and you're like, yeah, I'm just going to walk to the other entrance because I don't want to deal with them. Or you're going to walk past them. I can't even hear you. I'm just going to ignore them. I'm going to pretend like you're not even there. Right? And we treat them lesser than because of a situation they might find themselves in. And the thing about partiality, it's not just about rich and poor. It's not. Again, it can be anything. It can be someone standing by the door and they got a Trump hat on. You're like, yeah, no, I'm going to walk over here. I don't want to deal with them. Or someone standing by the door and they're wearing a BLM shirt or whatever the thing is, right? Someone standing by the door and it's, it's, it's that particular group of people that you're like, yeah, I don't want to deal with them. I don't want to acknowledge them. So I'm going to walk down to the other entrance or I'm just going to walk past them like they're not even here. This is partiality, and this is what James is trying to address, and he's saying, guys, we can't do this, and it's been in the church, and it's been in the church for a long time. It's been in the church since the beginning. He's talking about it, and the church is like months old, probably, when he's writing this letter. Like, Jesus has just ascended into heaven, and the Holy Spirit has come, and now people are starting to gather, and all of a sudden, he's starting to see this treatment of people. And it's been in the church for a long time. In fact, has anybody ever heard of a pew box before? Anybody know what a pew box is? A few people. So this, these kind of became popular in about the 1400s. Again, no middle class. So you have the rich people who want to come to church, and you have the poor people who want to come to church, except the rich people don't want to deal with the poor people. They don't want to sit next to them. They don't want to be infected by their presence. And so the church actually saw an opportunity to leverage a relationship with the rich. And the church said, hey, we will build these pew boxes. You can pay for them. And then when you pay for them, you won't have to deal with the poor. They, they would look something like this. Hey, this is where the rich people get to sit. They, they bought this right to sit up there. And so they, they, they would be probably filled with food and maybe some incense and pillows. And you, they could just relax during service, come to church, do their deed, and then leave and not have to deal with poor people. They locked. You'd go in and you'd lock them so poor people couldn't kind of make their way up to the pew box. See, this idea of partiality, it's, it's kind of a big deal. And it, it's, it's been in the church for a long time. And, and I would say it's still in the church today. And no, thank goodness we don't have pew boxes anymore, but... What, what do we have? What's in my life that I try to separate myself from people that I just kind of don't really want to deal with? And now, hear me out. This is not about, like, this is not about, like, I can't have close friends around me, right? Like, it's not that I can't have a group of friends that I hang out with with more than other people. It's not about, like, I have to get everyone equal access, equal time, equal attention. That's not it at all. Like, my wife gets more attention from me than anyone on the planet. Like, I don't care who you are, she's going to get my attention first. Um, but at the same time, it, it's, it's not about I can't have close friends. Like, Jesus had close friends, right? He had his 12 that he hung out with. Or right? even within the 12, there were like three that were like his very best friends, and then one that was his, like, most best friend. This is not about that. It's how do we treat people do I treat you less than or better than because I can think I can get something from you or less than because there's nothing you can do for me? How do I treat, do I have a kingdom mindset thinking or a worldly mindset thinking? That's what this is about. It's not like you can't have good friends that you're gonna go and have a 4th of July barbecue with and enjoy the day, but is there that one person that you just like, I, 
I would never invite them to this because of the face, right? Because of their face, because of what they look like on the outside, whether that's physically, politically, economically, whatever it might be. That's what James is talking about here. See, why is this such a big deal? Why is partiality such a big deal? It's such a big deal because when we treat people with partiality, we're either devaluing or dehumanizing them. We're devaluing or we're dehumanizing them. We're making them lesser of. Even when we treat people better, like, oh, you're better, and we treat them with this idea of what can I get from you, really, we don't care about the people. We care about what can I get from you? How can I gain from your relationship? And when we do that, we devalue them. We dehumanize them. Again, we go back to kingdom thinking versus worldly thinking. Jesus was always about humanizing people. That's what his kingdom was about, especially those who are marginalized, especially those who were on the outside. Jesus was always about humanizing them. But when we live a life of partiality, we say, like, oh, you, you, you're poor or you're homeless? Well, this is a decision you made. Clearly, it's your fault. You're probably on drugs. You're probably on alcohol. Like, this is all you. If you would have been smarter with your life, you wouldn't have ended up. You made the bed. Now lay in it. Pastor Brian talked about that last week. And so I can treat you a certain way, right? Or, or, or it can be anything. It's the political party. It's, oh, you're far left. You're all right. Like, oh, you're left. You hate people. You're far right. You hate people. Right? Apparently, we all hate people, you know? And, and, and But I'm going to treat you a certain way because of that. I know I can think about you in a certain way because of, because of this, or whether it's their sexuality, right? It's, oh, you're part of LGBTQ. That means I get to think a certain way about you, and I can treat you a certain way. Or, or, or it's the reverse, too. It goes both ways, right? Like, oh, you're, like, really wealthy, and you have lots of money. Well, clearly, like, your parents paid for college, and clearly you're privileged, so I get to think about you a certain way. And, oh, during Pride Month, you didn't post anything on Facebook, so now I get to think about you a certain way. And it's like you can't win no matter what because we're all treating each other with partiality. This is the way the world thinks. And what James is saying is, no, we have to have a kingdom mindset, we have to have a kingdom mindset and treat people the way Jesus did, who was always humanizing, always giving people value. You see, the reason, church, the reason as Christians we say that everyone has value is because what we read in Genesis is that everyone was created in the image of God. And so for all of humanity, humanity carries God's image. And because they carry God's image, they have value. Simple as that. Not because of what they can do, not because of their earning potential, not because of anything that they can contribute to society. The reason people have value is because they carry God's image. If they carry God's image, that means they have value from God. And we should treat them as such. And so what we see Jesus doing over and over again is Jesus is valuing the prostitute. He's valuing the tax collector. He's valuing women. He's valuing beggars. He's valuing Samaritans. He's valuing the lepers. All of these people that were absolutely pushed to the side and marginalized. Right? Like you, you see the story of the tax collector that Jesus has an interaction with. They were like the most hated people in the Jewish culture. Now, maybe you don't know why. Maybe you're like, well, of course they were. They're tax collectors. Like the IRS. We hate the IRS. Right? No. That's not, the, the tax collectors then were so much worse. You see, Jews were conquered people. They were conquered by Rome. And so Rome comes in and they would handpick Jews to collect taxes for them. Right? And they'd give them a ton of money to do it. And then these Jewish people would collect taxes and give them to Rome. So immediately, these Jews, the tax collectors, they were traitors to their country. They worked for Rome. They worked for the conquering nation. They were traitors. And then they had the power of Rome behind them. And so typically what would happen was a tax collector, say you owe 30% on your taxes. The tax collector would go, hey, you owe 40% on your taxes. They would give 10%, or the, the 30% to Rome and keep 10% for themselves. Everyone knew they were doing it. Rome didn't care. And the, and the Jews couldn't do anything about it because they had the power of Rome behind them. They were the most hated people, politically opposed to their countrymen, politically opposed to the rest of the Jews who the gospel went to first. And so what does Jesus do? He shows up and he goes up to a tax collector and he's like, hey, I'm going to go and have a meal with you. In that culture, having a meal with someone was a very big deal. It meant that you, you connected with them. You were community with them. Jesus says, I'm going to have a meal with you, Zacchaeus. He humanizes him. He humanizes him. So many times Jesus humanizes people. The Samaritan, 
Again, the Jews hated the Samaritans. It was completely a racist issue. It was a racial issue. It was racism in the Jews. They hated the Samaritans because Samaritans were half-breeds. They were half-Jews. They were, they had, their, their, their ancestors were Jews, but then they married outside of Israel. They, they married the Midianites and, and the Jebusites and the Gideonites. They, they, they married all of them, and, 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 and so they weren't pure Jews, and, so the, and they weren't supposed to do that. That was like in the law to not do that, and so the Jews hated them, and they felt like they had the right to through the law. They thought that racism was okay through the law because these people had done this. And so the Jews hated the Samaritans. They were dogs to them. And Jesus needs to go from point A to point B. He needs to go from Judea to Galilee. Now, there was a road that went right through Samaria, where, where the majority of the Samaritans live. Right through Samaria, when you'd go from Judea to, Gal- uh, to, to Galilee. But the Jews would take this long trip around. They would never walk through Samaria. And Jesus goes in his way, you might say, to humanize the Samaritans. And he tells the disciples, hey, we're going to go uh, to, to Galilee, and we're going to go through Samaria. And they're like, wait, we're doing What? These Jews, his disciples had never stepped foot in Samaria before. They would never do that. These guys are dogs to them. And so they walk through Samaria, and the the disciples are losing their minds, and it's so bad that Jesus is like, go get food. Like, go get lunch. You guys are annoying me. (laughs) And and they go there, and, and they come back, and now Jesus is having an interaction with a Samaritan woman. How dare he? And he humanizes her. And all of a sudden, the kingdom of God falls in her heart and she goes back to her community and they end up staying there for days preaching the gospel and the spirit of God is moving in this community that had been judged and where these disciples had hated these people for so long but Jesus is humanizing them he always humanized people wherever they went see James says when you judge people or when you treat people with partiality he says you become judges with evil thoughts You become judges with evil thoughts because partiality, it is the antithesis of the gospel. It is the antithesis of the good news. It is the exact opposite when you treat people with partiality versus when you treat people like Jesus treated them. It is the exact opposite. See, when we treat people with partiality, we tell the world that greatness is more important than grace. That greatness is greater than grace. In other words, what you can do with your life, if you align politically with me, if you align socially with me, if you can make enough money, that's what's important, not the grace that has been given to you. Yeah, grace is good, but what can you do for me now? That's what we tell the world when we treat people with partiality. But you see, in front of a holy God, nobody stands out. In front of a holy God, nobody stands out. Do you think God's in heaven going, wow, you are an incredible singer. I didn't even give you that talent. You you got that all on your own. And well done. I'm proud of you. Oh, that business venture you did, whoa, I would never thought to do that. I can't believe you figured, you you sold and you bought at the right time and you moved. Wow, that's impressive. I think God's in heaven impressed by us, impressed by any one of us. No, in front of it, oh, holy God, when you read Isaiah 6 and the temple's filled with smoke and it's shaking and he sees the cherubim and the seraphim flying around God and God's voice speaks, you think his speaking of, wow, Isaiah, I'm I'm impressed by you. No, it is in front of a holy God. Nobody stands out. And this is such good news, right? Because what it means is we're all on the same playing ground. We all start at the same. Nobody gets to start with an advantage above somebody else. We all start as broken, sinful people in need of the grace of God. In need of the grace of God. You see, but far too often we, we treat people with this partiality that James is talking about. And this can kind of feel a little heavy, and I get it because James is really hammering on this in in, in this area. But James talks about how this is sin. This is sin to live in partiality. And he he writes this in verse 10 and 11. This is what he says. He says, Forever keeps the whole law but fails in one point becomes guilty of it all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now, I'll be honest, if I had written this, I probably would have flipped those. Like, it's interesting. You didn't commit adultery, but you murdered. But hey, you still committed adultery. 
I, I feel like the other one's worse, but maybe not. <laughs> but James writes this, he says, basically saying, look, if you've committed the sin of partiality, you've also broken the law of murder and the law of adultery. Like, you, you've broken all of the law. It's all been broken. This is an important thing to understand. Like, this is sin that we've allowed in our lives, but too often, in, in, in the church at least, we have, like, acceptable sins and unacceptable sins, right? Like, these things are in that big of a deal, treating someone a little better than somebody else. Because, eh, who cares? Treating someone a little worse because, yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're homeless and doesn't, eh, like, they're just going to spend it on alcohol anyway. Like, like, that's not as bad as, like, murdering somebody, is it? But what James is saying is, you've broken one law, you've broken them all, and, and, and you're under sin. You're under this law that, is, that, it, that says you're guilty of sin. And so, what do we do with this? As I was writing this, I was like, man, this is kind of heavy. And it's the 4th of July, come on. Like, where can I slip in a joke here, make this not such a big deal? But I couldn't. It's a big deal. It is. And I think it's important for us to hear. And, and I think it's really healthy for us to go, wow, is this in my life? But the question is, is what is the opposite of partiality? Here's what we need to get at. Is what is the opposite? So if we can go, okay, this is what partiality is. This is what it looks like. This is a sin. How do I live differently from this? How do I live kingdom-minded? How, how do I go about my day, the rest of the day, and, and, and live this differently? And I love it because James actually ends this on this pretty positive note. And I love it. So I want to read in verse 12. He says, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does that mean? What is James saying? What is the opposite of partiality? I love what he says here. He says, Speak and act. Speak and act. And what he's saying here is he's, he's not saying this one-time thing. Hey, hey, say this thing, do this thing, and then you're good. No, what he's saying is live a lifestyle of speaking and acting. But how do we speak and act? How do we live a lifestyle? What are we supposed to speak and act about? He says speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Josh, I thought you said this was going to get better. Now you're saying speak and act as if I'm going to get judged. Thanks. Feeling really good about myself. Speak and act as if judgment is coming. That's positive, right? Well, it is important for us to live and understand that judgment is coming. Jesus talks about it. Paul talks about it. James talks about it. Peter talks about it. John talks about it. It is a very important thing for us to live our lives as, as believers that judgment is coming. And what we say and what we do actually matters. But it's not any judgment. He says that we're going to be judged under the law of liberty. This is really encouraging for us. What is this law of liberty that he's talking about? What is the law of liberty? What does that mean? He's saying that the things you do and the things you say, they're going to be judged. But there is a law of liberty, if you're a follower of Jesus, that they're going to be judged by. See, what we read in, in Romans, again, we talked about this just a second ago, that, that, that there's no one starts off better than anybody else, that we're all sinners, every single one of us. And that scripture says in Romans, Paul lays it out in this amazing way that all have sinned, all of us, and, and that our sin separates us from God, and the payment for our sin is death. And if you've been around church, you've heard this before, but maybe you need to hear it again. And maybe your first time coming today and you've never heard this and you're like, oh, that sounds really depressing. So you're saying I'm just a sinner? Yeah, yeah, this is what scripture teaches us, but there's really good news with that. Because Paul says, oh, it's scripture, throughout, we read the life of Jesus, that, that God said, look, there's separation between me and humanity. And remember, we carry God's image. He loves us. So he says, I gotta do something about it. So Jesus steps in and he pays our payment of sin and death. He lives the life that we couldn't live to pay the price that we could never pay. And he goes to the cross and he raises again from the dead, defeating sin and death, so that we could receive the law of liberty, not the law that crushes us, the law that we couldn't live up to. Jesus lived out that law, and now we are judged by the law of liberty. So the things that we say and the things that we do are covered by the grace of God. They are covered by the grace of God. In that we, now we still strive to obey God, 
We still have a lifetime of, of, of work. It's called sanctification, where we are working our lives out to look more and more like Jesus every day. But at the same time, there's this thing over here. It's this Bible term called justification, where we stand before God as holy. We stand before God in a right relationship. Okay, We stand before God in a right relationship as if we're perfect because of what Jesus did, not because of anything we did. We could only receive it, and that's it. But we stand before God as perfect, and that is the law of liberty that we get to be judged by. How did you speak? How did you act? Jesus. Right? How did you live your life? Jesus. That's the law that we get to be judged by. And so we're to speak as if you've received liberty. We're to act as if you received liberty. And we're to live as if you will be judged by liberty. In other words, now that you know that you have liberty, how would you live differently? I love this quote that I found last week. It says this, God's gracious acceptance of us does not end our obligation to obey him. It sets us on a new footing. No longer is God's law a threatening, confining burden. Four, the will of God now confronts us as the law of liberty, an an obligation that is to discharge the joyful knowledge uh, that God has both liberated us from the penalty of sin and given us his spirit, the power to obey his will. To use James' own description, this law is an implanted word written on the hearts that written on the heart that has the power to save us. I love this. No, we're not, we don't receive liberty so we can just stop obeying God. We receive liberty and it puts us on a new footing, a new ground that we can live freely. But understand, like what I say and what I do, it's gonna get judged. I, I, I wanna follow God, but I'm just gonna be judged by liberty. And so, how are we to act? We're to treat people the way Jesus treats us. That what is the opposite of partiality? Liberty. That we would treat people with liberty, that the things I say towards people and the way I act towards people would be liberty towards them, grace towards them. To love people, to humanize people the way Jesus humanized us. That that's the way I treat everybody. That no matter who you are, that you're going to receive liberty and grace from me. Now, I've received this pushback before and I've heard people say, Oh, Josh, when when you talk about this, what what you're really doing is you're saying that sin doesn't matter. Sin's not important. Sin's not a big deal. we got to deal with people's sin. We talk about grace too much. Talk about liberty too much. We gotta deal with sin. Trust me, God cares more about sin than you do. God takes sin more seriously than you do, than I do. Sin is a big deal, and God is very serious about it. It's why Jesus came and died in your place. Somebody had to die for the sin of the world. It is very serious, but what we need to understand about God is that God is 100% just, but he's also 100% grace. It's not 50-50. It's not 49-51%. He's a little bit more grace than he is judgment. He's 100% both, and he takes sin very, very seriously. Again, it's why Jesus died in your place. But how do we extend liberty and not encourage sin. Oh, all roads lead to God. It doesn't matter what you believe. Oh, you can stay in your sin. It's not a big deal. No. The way we extend the law of liberty in what we say and what we do is that we have to bring people to Jesus, that we deal with people's sin by bringing them to Jesus. That is how we deal with the sin of the world. That is how we show mercy. We show mercy to people by bringing them to Jesus to deal with their sin. We have to treat people with this law of liberty. Again, that is the kingdom mindset. That is the kingdom mindset. And I love how James ends verse 13. He says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does this mean? 
No mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Mercy to the one who shows mercy. Is James saying that to receive mercy, we have to act a certain way? Is James saying that if I don't show mercy to you, then I'm not going to receive mercy? In other words, how many times, if I mess it up once, do I never receive mercy? Can I show mercy most of the time, but not all the time? Like, where's the line? What does James mean when he says, judgment is without mercy to the one who show no mercy? Mercy triumphs over judgment. What's he saying there? Here's what I believe he's saying. Here's, I think, the point that James is trying to make. If you're the type of person that just can't ever seem to give people grace, if you're the type of person that can't ever seem to show mercy, especially to those that you deem on the outside, right? If partiality is always in your heart and you're always treating people a specific way, especially those, again, that you would never receive into your community, and if that is always there, and it's like, man, I'm trying to love these people, but I just hate them, right? You're the I hate people type of person. It's kind of funny, like you see this bunch of I hate people. That's why I'm moving to Alaska. That's why I'm getting out into the woods. That's why I don't like to be around people. Now, I get being introverted and stuff like that. It can be exhausting. But if that's really who you are, like, I just kind of hate people. I don't like people. My question to you would be then this. If you can't ever give out mercy to people, have you really actually ever received mercy from God? If you can't ever dole out mercy and be merciful to those that you deem as lesser than, my question is, have you actually ever received mercy yourself in your own heart? I think that's what James is saying here. He says, judgment without mercy. If you're always judging people and never giving mercy, odds are you've never received mercy from God. See, too often I think we can get into this place of like, oh yes, like the Bible's right and Jesus and amen to these things, but we've never actually had an encounter with God in our lives. I think, there's a, I think the church, churches around the world are full of people that have never actually had an encounter with Jesus, never actually received Jesus, never actually surrendered their heart to Jesus, but they are all about Jesus. They're all about, you know, it's kind of like how the Pharisees were. They're all about God. They're all about the rules and the law, but they, they missed the whole point. And this is kind of a scary statement, but the truth is, affirming Jesus is not the same as surrendering to him. Affirming Jesus is not the same as surrendering to Jesus. We can affirm the Bible and we can affirm Jesus. And James actually writes, hey, even the demons do that. They affirm Jesus. Right? You say you believe in Jesus? Cool. So do the demons. It's like, ow, James, thanks. And he, and he goes on, he makes it worse. He says, they're smart enough to be afraid of him. It's like the question, are you smart enough to feel dumb, right? Like, wait, what? The, the, they're smart. Like, you're not even smart enough to know, like, who God is. The demons know who God is. That They believe in him. But have you surrendered your heart to Christ? Have you surrendered your heart? See, if you can't give out mercy, if all you see is judgment for people, then odds are you probably have not received mercy because scripture is really clear. When we say yes to Jesus, that God puts his spirit within you. He removes your heart of stone. He gives you a heart of flesh. And God himself, the God of the universe, the God who, who spoke into existence, his spirit comes and he lives in you. And I promise you, when that happens, things change. You cannot stay the same person. Now, it doesn't mean all of a sudden, again, you're living your life perfectly, like, oh, all these struggles I had, they're gone. It doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is all of a sudden my heart is changing and, and my tune is changing. And yes, these people still drive me crazy, but I'm finding it in my heart naturally to, to love them. God's kingdom is filling in my heart and more and more every day I'm finding myself loving these people that I used to just hate. Right? When God's spirit comes into your life, it changes you. And we just talked about that justification and sanctification. When it comes in your heart, you say just before God. And there's a life of learning to live like Jesus, that we will live until the day we die, when finally it will be perfected. But that there's actually change happening. That's the difference between just affirming Jesus and, and, and surrendering to him, that God's spirit lives in you. And life is breathed into a dead soul. And now I see the world differently. And yeah, I got my struggles. 
but now mercy, I'm finding myself finding mercy for those that I have not had mercy for in the past. And so I want to I give us some steps, some challenges for us, because I don't want to just hear the word and then go out and enjoy our barbecue today and just forget everything we kind of walked through this morning. Then we just totally wasted our time here. And so we have these things, they're called action steps. We do them every week. They're on the card on the seat in front of you. I would encourage you to fill it out and you can drop it in, in one of the boxes. There's also going to be um, first impressions people by all the doors with baskets that can take them from you. But it's this idea like I'm going to do something. And when you mark down, when you check the one you're going to do, all you're going to get this week is just a text that encourages you, lets you know we're praying for you and encourages you in the area that you said you want to do. But here's our action steps. The first one says, say yes to Jesus. Maybe you've realized like, man, I've just been someone who's affirmed Jesus my entire life, but I've never actually surrendered my heart to him. I've never actually experienced mercy in my own life. And I find myself really struggling to have mercy for people. Maybe... Maybe you've been coming to church your whole life, but you just need to say, you know what? I'm going to surrender my life to you today, Jesus. Or maybe it's your first Sunday with us and you've never known who Jesus was and you want to say yes to him. That's step one would be to say yes to Jesus. Step two would be pray and ask God to show you where you have the sin of partiality in your life. That's a scary one. I'm not going to lie because God loves to answer those prayers. I love the prayer of David. God, search me, O oh God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. God is saying, yes, I will love to answer that prayer and show you, not to shame you, but so that you can deal with it. Receive mercy from God and work that out and see it in your own life. Three, do something that costs you for somebody that cannot pay you back this week. Can you do something that will cost you for somebody that just can't pay you back? It's not a won't pay you back. There's a difference between can't and won't, right? We have that uncle that just loves to mooch and the brother-in-law that loves to mooch and they, they can pay you back, they just don't want to. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that person that just, they're in a place, they're in a situation, they're in a place in life that they cannot pay you back for the generosity that you would show them. Do something like that this week for somebody. And finally, invite somebody into your community who is outside of your circle. Invite somebody into your community who's outside of your circle. It doesn't mean you have to be best friends and now you have this new best friend that you're going to do everything with, but do you ever have people that you look out on the outside, you see as marginalized, you see as, yeah, I would never walk through that part of town, that I would never walk through Samaria, but you're going to invite some, a Samaritan into your circle of community this week. Because what if, church, what if ACF, we did this? What if we stopped living our lives with partiality? What if we could actually start treating people the way Jesus did, humanizing people, giving them value wherever we went? What kind of impact do you think that would have in Eagle River, in Chugiak, Jay Bear, in Anchorage, in Palmer, in Wasilla, if you're watching online? in your community, in your circle of sphere, of your circle of influence, what kind of impact would that have if a group of us together said, hey, we're not going to treat people with partiality. We're going to treat everyone the same with value and humanize them. What kind of impact would that have, would the gospel have in our communities? I think it would be a great one in your workplace, in your family, in your neighborhood. If the church didn't look like the world, if the church didn't look like the world, but we looked like the kingdom of God, I think it would make a really big difference. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. God, thank you that you don't treat us with partiality. Thank you, Jesus, that we don't have to earn our standing with you. We don't have to be good enough. We don't have to look good enough. We don't have to make enough money. We don't have to have everything lined out with our beliefs totally perfect. Like you accept us where we're at because we're all broken and that's where we're at. God, I pray as we receive this law of liberty in our lives, let it change us from the inside and let us not even be able to help but live out liberty to the world around us. Holy Spirit, we cannot do this without you. Holy Spirit, we cannot live out the law of liberty without you empowering us. We're not capable. So Holy Spirit, empower us every day 
as those surrendered to you to live out this law of liberty and show the world what the kingdom of God looks like and not look just like the world, not be stained by the world, but to live out this law of liberty. Forgive us, God. Empower us, Holy Spirit. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for watching this message from ACF Church. Uh, We hope it's encouraged you and challenged you to be more like Jesus and to walk with Him in a closer and more profound way. If you'd like to give to the mission of ACF Church, you can do so at the link on the screen or at acfak.org. We love you and we'll see you next week.